Welcome everyone to today's MI webcast. I'm Pedro da Costa, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker, the President of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, Dr. Loretta Mester. President Mester is an FOMC voter this year. And as a distinguished and widely published economist, she's also a prominent voice in today's debate on monetary policy. It's really, really happy to have you today. Thank you so much for being here with us. She's been leading the Cleveland Fed since 2014 and was previously research director at the Philadelphia Fed, where I first got to, to know her. Dr. Mester will give prepared remarks today lasting about 20 minutes, after which time we'll begin a Q&A session that will include both my own questions and questions from our audience around the world. Anyone who's watching can submit a question using the chat function, and we'll do our best to get your question asked and answered. And that'll be running until 11.15 Eastern time. The Fed has made clear that bringing inflation back to a 2% target is mission number one. And so I look forward to hearing President Nestor's views today on what recent economic data tell us about the Fed's likely path on interest rates, how quantitative tightening might affect the outlook for credit markets, and the likely path of inflation. To be clear, this is a public event, and so we're fully on the record. And I thank many, our, many of our colleagues from other media outlets for joining us today as well. And with that, the floor is yours, President Messer. Thanks again for being with us. Well, thanks very much, um, Pedro, for the introduction, and really thank you for the opportunity to speak today on the MNI webcast. So I'm going to focus my opening remarks on how monetary policy will foster a return to price stability. Oh. And I'm very much looking forward to the question and answer portion of the session to hear what's on your mind. And, and of course, the views I'm going to present today are my own and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. So the key challenge facing our economy is unacceptably high inflation. Inflation has been running well above 2% for over a year now. It's very high, not only in the US, but in other advanced economies around the globe. And this inflation stems from many factors, but fundamentally it reflects an imbalance between strong demand and constrained supply, which has led to significant upward pressures on prices. Like inflation is the number one concern of businesses and households. And that's evident if you look at surveys or in my conversations with regional contexts, they're always talking about how difficult the inflation environment is. High inflation imposes a particularly onerous burden on those who don't have the wherewithal to pay for more essentials, uh, pay more for essentials like food and gasoline and shelter, and who now have to make some really hard choices about how to spend their money. Now, price stability is the foundation of a strong economy. It's necessary for ensuring that the U.S. can sustain healthy labor market conditions over the medium and longer run, and that the economy can be productive and live up to its potential for everyone's benefit. And the FOMC is committed to using its tools to bring inflation back down to our longer run goal of 2%. It's taking decisive action to remove monetary policy accommodation to bring demand into better balance with constrained supply in both product and labor markets. Since March of this year, the FOMC has raised the target range of the Fed funds rate by two and a quarter percentage points, and it's begun to reduce the assets the Fed's holding on its balance sheet, which also uh, will reduce accommodation. So given current rates of inflation, I believe the Fed has more work to do in order to get inflation under control. And this will entail further rate increases to tighten financial conditions, resulting in an economic transition to below trend growth and nominal output, slower employment growth, and a higher unemployment rate. So economic activity is beginning to slow down from last year's robust pace. It is responding to our monetary policy actions and to the tightening and overall financial conditions since last year. But the slowdown also reflects how households and businesses are responding to very high inflation and their concerns about the economic outlook, to the waning effects of the pandemic fiscal stimulus and to slower growth abroad. Consumer spending, housing activity, and business investment have decelerated from the robust pace we've seen last year. In fact, the level of real GDP decreased in the first half of this year. Now, despite this moderation, aggregate demand is still out of balance with aggregate supply, 
which remains constrained due to supply chain disruptions stemming from pandemic-related shutdowns across the globe and the war in Ukraine. And many of the firms we talk to tell us that they will be investing to make their supply chains more resilient, to be better prepared for the future. But in the meantime, supply disruptions remain a challenge and, and they have added to price pressures. Now, analysts often use the rule of thumb that two consecutive quarters of negative real GDP growth means the economy is in recession. I do not believe the US economy is currently in a recession because the labor market is so strong. I do believe that the risk of recession over the next two years have moved up because financial conditions are tightening globally. Inflation is very high in many countries. Global growth is slowing and the devastating war in Ukraine is adding considerable uncertainty and downside risk to the growth outlook, especially in Europe. So I'm in the process of preparing my submission to the Summary of Economic Projections of FOMC Participants, which is gonna be released after our next FOMC meeting in two weeks. At this point, I've not incorporated a recession into my baseline outlook for the US, but instead I expect a fairly sharp slowing in activity, especially when compared to the robust growth the US experienced in 2021. While there is considerable uncertainty, I currently expect that the US economy will return to positive growth in the second half of the year. But for this year as a whole and for next year, I expect growth to be well below 2%, which is my estimate of trend growth. With the economy growing below trend, I expect labor market conditions to cool, with the unemployment rate rising somewhat above 4% by the end of next year. Now, some cooling off in the labor market will put it on more sustainable footing compared to the unsustainably tight conditions that exist today. The employment report for August released last Friday suggests that we're beginning to see some moderation, but that labor market conditions remain strong. Last year, the economy added 6.7 million jobs, a robust average of over 550,000 jobs per month. This year, average job gains have slowed to about 440,000 per month. The unemployment rate rose in August, but at 3.7%, it remains very low. The increase in the unemployment rate partly reflects an increase in labor force participation. Now, the participation rate of primate workers has returned to where one would expect it to be. Many people chose to retire during the pandemic and left the labor force. And so the overall participation rate, which includes those of retirement age, has risen only gradually. A continued rise in participation would be helpful in easing the imbalance between labor market demand and labor market supply. But typically most people do not return to the job market once they've retired. So there's really little reason to think that we'll see an influx of workers that's large enough to return the overall participation rate to its pre-pandemic level. Although the number of job openings has eased in recent months, labor demand is still outpacing labor supply. There's still almost double the number of openings per unemployed worker. To put that into perspective, in 2019, which was another time of tight labor markets, there were about one and a quarter, 1.2 openings per unemployed worker. And contacts across a broad spectrum of firms tell us that it's been really difficult to find workers. They, they've been using a variety of ways to attract and retain staff, including offering more flexible work schedules, signing and retention bonuses, expanded benefits, and higher base wages. The employment cost index for private industry workers accelerated over the six months ending in June, rising at a 6% annual pace. More recent reports suggest that wage pressures may be beginning to stabilize, but they remain high. Even so, for many workers, their wage increases have not kept up with inflation and their purchasing power is being eroded. With trend productivity growth estimated to be about a quarter, one and a quarter to one and a half percent, wage growth will need to moderate to around three and a quarter to three and a half percent to be consistent with price stability. Now, as their costs have continued to rise, businesses have been raising the prices they charge their customers and finding little resistance. Despite some moderation in economic activity, inflation readings continue to be at the highest levels in 40 years. Measured year over year, PC inflation came in at about six and a quarter percent in July, 
CPI inflation was 8.5%. Now, these readings were down slightly from the June readings, mainly reflecting a sharp drop in the price of gasoline and energy. This was welcome news, but I think we have to guard against wishful thinking becoming a substitute for compelling evidence. In my view, it's far too soon to conclude that inflation has peaked, let alone that it's on a sustainable downward path to 2%. Measures of the underlying inflation trend did not uniformly de decline in July. And given developments related to the ongoing war in Ukraine, gas and energy prices may move higher again later this year. In addition, services inflation, which tends to be persistent, is at its highest level since the early 1990s, with growth in housing, rent, and shelter costs likely to keep inflation elevated for some time. So in my view, it will take a while for inflation to return to the Fed's 2% goal, but I do expect inflation to move down into a range of five to 6% for this year, and then to make more progress towards our goal over the next two years, because I expect the Fed to take further action to make it so. In making its monetary policy decisions, the FOMC is always guided by its strong commitment to achieving its congressionally mandated goals of price stability and maximum employment. Monetary policy cannot affect the supply side factors that have contributed to the very high inflation readings. Instead, it works on the demand side of the economy. And the Fed is being resolute and intentional in tightening financial conditions to bring demand into better balance with supply to alleviate price pressures. Since March, we've raised the target range of the Fed funds rate a cumulative two and a quarter percentage points and financial conditions are tighter than they were at the end of last year. In addition, in June, we began to reduce the size of our balance sheet according to the plan announced in May. Reducing the amount of the Fed's security holdings will help to lessen downward pressure on longer term interest rates by returning duration to the market. Now, the reduction in our balance sheet is being done primarily by adjusting how much we reinvest to the principal payments we receive on our assets. Without asset sales, the process could take three years or so. I would favor the FOMC's considering selling some of our agency mortgage-backed securities at some point during balance sheet reduction in order to speed the return to our portfolio's composition to being primarily treasury securities Holding mainly treasuries will help to minimize the effect of the Fed's holdings on the allocation of credit across economic sectors. Now, as always the case, we will be calibrating our monetary policy based on the implications of incoming information for the economic outlook and on the progress toward our monetary policy goals. Monetary policy acts with a lag on the economy. So it's unlikely that we've seen the full effect on households and businesses of the rate increases we have implemented so far. Moreover, because of the lag effects of monetary policy, it would not be appropriate to continue moving rates up until inflation is back down to 2%. That said, given the current level of inflation and the economic outlook, I believe that further increases in our policy rate are needed. We will need to move policy into a restrictive stance in order to put inflation on a sustained downward trajectory to 2%. That means that short-term interest rates adjusted for expected inflation, that is real interest rates, will need to move into positive territory and remain there for some time. Right now, nominal short-term interest rates are lower than expected inflation, so short-term real interest rates are still negative and monetary policy is still accommodated. My current view is that it will be necessary to move the nominal Fed funds rate up to somewhat above 4% by early next year and hold it there. I do not anticipate the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate target next year. But I want to emphasize that this is based on my current reading of the economy and the outlook. While it's clear that the Fed funds rate needs to move up from its current level, the size of rate increases at any particular FOMC meeting and the peak Fed funds rate will depend on the inflation outlook, which depends on the assessment of how rapidly aggregate demand and supply are coming back into better balance and price pressures are being reduced. Making that assessment will remain challenging because there's a high level of uncertainty surrounding the outlook for the global economy. Both the demand side and the supply side of the economy will be affected by a variety of forces, 
including the war in Ukraine and the energy situation in Europe, the global economic outlook, the sentiment of consumers and businesses and their reaction to elevated inflation readings, changes in supply chain disruptions, and labor force participation. Now, in formulating my monetary policy views, views, I'm going to be guarding against declaring victory over the inflation beast too soon. Doing so would put us back in the stop and go monetary policy world of the 1970s, which was very costly to households and businesses. Before I conclude that inflation has peaked, I will need to see several months of declines in the month over month readings. And I'm also going to be carefully watching measures of inflation expectations, particularly expectations of inflation over the medium and longer term. The rise in inflation expectations since last year has been concentrated in shorter term expectations, which tend to move with gasoline prices and the prices of other salient items like food. Nonetheless, medium and longer term expectations remain at the upper end of the range of values consistent with our 2% inflation goal. And they could move up further depending on inflation developments over the balance of the year. A risk management perspective on monetary policymaking strongly argues against being complacent about a rise in longer term expectations. If longer term inflation expectations were to become unanchored and move above levels consistent with our longer run inflation goal, high inflation would become embedded in the economy, affecting the actions of both firms and consumers. At that point, it would be considerably more difficult and more costly to bring inflation down. Better economic outcomes are achieved when policymakers assume that rises in inflation and inflation expectations are persistent and act forcefully to bring both down. Such action gives the public more confidence that policymakers are committed to ensuring price stability, and this helps to anchor the public's expectations about inflation, reinforcing the effect of the policy action itself. The return to price stability will take some time and a lot of fortitude. There will be bumps along the road. Financial markets could well remain volatile as financial conditions tighten further. Growth could slow more than expected and return to negative territory. And the unemployment rate could move above estimates of its longer run level. This will be painful in the near term, but so is high inflation. High inflation imposes costs on households and businesses in both the short and the long run. It eats into savings and makes it harder to plan for the future. Perhaps Paul Volcker said it best as he fought inflation in the 1980s, quote, failure to carry through now in the fight on inflation will only make any subsequent effort more difficult and much greater risk to the economy, end quote. So in summary, price stability is the foundation for sustaining maximum employment and a healthy, productive economy over time. I do not view the current situation as one in which there's a trade-off between our two monetary policy goals. If we fail to take decisive action to get inflation down and firmly anchor inflation expectations, we will not be able to sustain healthy labor markets over the medium and long run to the detriment of the public. So that concludes my um, prepared remarks. I'm really looking forward to hearing the, the questions and to providing my answers to them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Messer. Those are really clear and in-depth remarks and we appreciate it. And uh, we're already getting some nice questions from the audience, but I wanna encourage anybody who has questions to use the chat function so I'll be able to see them and I'll, I'll pick them out as we go along. Before I get into the questions that have already been submitted, I want to do a couple of quick follow-ups on your speech. The first being that you said you see rates basically peaking a little bit above 4% early next year, but you also emphasize that you want to make sure that real rates are positive, you know, become positive and stay there for some time. Do you see an upside risk to your terminal rate forecast in that context? Well, I think there's risks on both sides always when you're doing policy. So we have to sort of, as I said, make this assessment about is demand coming into better balance with supply? And both things are going to be moving over the balance of the year, right? It's demand we know is starting to moderate, hasn't really impacted inflation yet. And that's what we're looking to see. Supply side, you know, there's, there's uh, things on the supply side that may add to inflationary pressures. Perhaps we'll get more labor market coming back, labor participation going up, that might affect things. So again, I don't think we can say today, I can, I can give you my, that's my sort of modal 
have, but again, I want to emphasize that we're going to be having to evaluate this as we go forward. Of course, that helps inform sort of the, you know, having that sort of forecast informs what I might want to do at any particular meeting. But again, I think it's really an assessment of, are we beginning to see inflation moderate and price pressures come down? And is inflation, you know, on that sustainable downward path to 2%? Two, 2%. I think it's really um, not a good policy to too early to declare inflation's on that downward path. So that's why I need to see some compelling evidence that it is on that path. Absolutely, and you, you were clear-eyed about the, the possibility for inflation to remain sticky. I wonder, you mentioned the risk of a stop and go policy. Do you see a risk that your messaging could get muddled, if you will, if you slow down the pace of hikes going into the end of the year and early next year, and then it turns out that inflation doesn't come down as expected and then you have to hike further. Is that, does that fit into the stop and go scenario or is that just par for the course? Well, I think the way to think about it is, is, is are we increasing rates because we haven't seen inflation make progress? At any particular meeting, you know, I know the financial markets are very fixated on what's going to happen in the next meeting, what the size of that rate increase. But to my mind, it's better to focus on what, what is the path of interest rates and do we need to do more to get inflation under control? I did the best I could in sort of explaining my views, but of course the committee gets together and share gets together um, every six weeks or so to share their views on the economy. And that's where those decisions about any particular meeting. You know, I think we should be gauging our policy path to incoming information as it informs the outlook. I think a lot of times um, people misunderstand that any one report, right, is, is instrumental in deciding, you know, which, which direction we're going into. And that certainly isn't the way I approach policy. I like to look at the information that's coming in and then say, okay, well, what does that mean? Right for my own outlook, you know, is my outlook basically what it was given the incoming information? Where does the incoming information, as a group, you know, collectively say, okay, I need to adjust how I think the economy is evolving, and then from that, okay, what do I need to do with policy to make sure we're getting inflation back to two percent? That's kind of the thought process I go through, um, and then of course you always have to think about the risks, as you pointed out, right? There are risks on both the upside and the downside, but right now. Right, it's very important for the economy over the medium and long run that we get back to price stability, and that's where my focus is. Sure, and you mentioned the market short-term focus, so I, I have to ask if we teach to get it out of the way. Do you have a preference at this point for for what the market, uh, what the move size should be for September? Well, I'm, again, I'm going to wait until the meeting, and then you know that's where I think those decisions are made. So, you know, I think we do have to raise rates from where they are now. I think we have to get, you know, into uh, positive territory for the real rate. Um, and that means we're going to have to do more work from where we are now in order to put inflation on a downward path. You mentioned your, the SCP forecast changes that you're in the process of making. Do you expect the path of inflation that at least your forecast will show to be more persistent than it was in June? Or is that uh, It'll probably be higher this year than what I marked down in June and probably a little higher next year as well with inflation coming back to 2%, you know, making more progress next year, but not back to 2%. Okay. So we have a question from Brian Sheed of Scheid from the audience. He, he says that at Jackson Hole, Chair Powell mentioned that if the public expects inflation will remain low and stable over time, then absent major shocks, it likely will. Uh, so he wonders where you think the public perception of inflation is currently and how you think it's impacting the future path of inflation, which is another way of saying, are we still actually anchored or has the anchor become wobblier? Yeah, well, we know that short run inflation expectations have gone up because they move with gasoline prices and other kind of prices. And we have an inflation research center here at the Cleveland Fed, which is doing really good, I think, an interesting work on sort of monitoring those inflation expectations, consumer inflation expectations. Over the medium and longer run, we have seen inflation expectations move up. Remember, prior to the pandemic, we had been for many years in a low, below our, our target of 2%, right? And the worry then was inflation expectations might become unanchored on the downside. Now they've moved up. Um, I would say they're still in the range um, consistent with 
you know, a 2% inflation goal. However, the fact that they've moved up and they also tend to be more, have moved really with current inflation developments, suggests that I'm gonna be very attentive to that because we know from all the research that's been done and from our previous history, um, that if you allow that to happen, if you don't take decisive action against, you know, an unanchoring of inflation expectations, you then create much more costly um, path to getting inflation back under control because those higher inflation expectations reinforce the higher inflation readings. And so you have to be working on both fronts to bring inflation back down. So, you know, the research I've seen and, and uh, which I find very persuasive is if you're doing, if you're really doing the cost benefit or the risk management approach, right? You are better off, you get better economic outcomes if you assume those increases in inflation expectations and inflation are more persistent and take actions, right? To make sure that they don't get above the, the level consistent with 2% inflation, then trying to fix it ex post. And so, you know, you're never, you can never tell for sure, right, whether it's a, a, a movement that will reverse itself, et cetera. But you are, the, the research is very compelling that you should assume it is and take action rather than wait and see, get it to be evolved, you know, revealed and then find out, oh, you should have taken action. Can you talk a little bit about how you're looking at the evolution of inflation pressures, what sectors you're watching and most worried about? and what sectors maybe could provide some relief? Yeah, I mean, I think the commodity prices and you know, we've seen some easing off of some of those. You talk to firms and they're telling us that you know, they've been able to do some pretty good work on their supply chains to make sure that you know, they're able to secure um, their inputs without paying you know, as much as they had earlier in the, so there's some size on the, there's some good signs on the good side. I think right now my focus is on the services side because one, that tends to be much more persistent and rents are still very elevated and it takes a while for rents to show up in underlying inflation. So there's still more that's gonna show up on that side of, of the equation. And that's where I'm kind of more focused on. And I haven't seen much in the way of suggesting that that's starting to come back down. So that's why I'm not even convinced that it's peaked, that inflation's peaked yet. I know. Some people are thinking it's it's already turned back down, but I haven't even I'm not even convinced of that yet. And I need to really be convinced that it's on this downward path, that's sustainable downward path, not you know down one month, up the next month. I want to see much more um, compelling evidence that it's really on its way down. Sure. So we have a, a ton of questions coming in, so I'm going to get right to them and try to keep them in a in an order that's uh, that makes a little bit of sense, but. Chris Rugaber at, at the Associated Press has a, a detailed question, which is but an important one. He asks, when you see when you say that you need to declines in the month over month readings, do you mean actual negative prints or just declines from the high month, the current my high monthly readings? Are you yeah. talking about getting into the point twos or is do we need to see the actual decline? Yeah. No, I want to just see them coming down. So they don't have to go negative. We don't have to see price declines necessarily, but I want to see that month over month we're making much more progress of reigning in inflation, right? Because first it has to stop rising, then it has to start turning back down. So again, you know, you have to see it now, you know, the reason I like the month to month is that if you're at a turning point, that's, it's going to show up in those readings and not be affected by base effects that, you know, what was happening last year at this time in inflation. So I, I'd like to just see a string of those monthly, you know, easing price pressures in the monthly numbers. And that'll tell us, I think, um, that inflation is indeed peaked and coming, starting to come back down. Yeah. I haven't seen it yet. Maybe we'll get it. In the, do you have any expectation for the upcoming CPI report? Yeah, yeah waiting for the data, just like all of you are. Yeah. Ryan Smedley asks, uh, you mentioned the need to save, see wage growth slow to achieve the inflation target. And he asked what you make of the rise in unit labor costs which is, is, at a, is growing at a double digit annualized rate in Q1 and Q2. Uh, and, and whether negative productivity growth, if it persists, means that we need to see wage growth slow even further. Well, my hope is that we won't see negative productivity growth persist. I mean, the trend productivity growth numbers are really important for the welfare of the you know, economy, standards of living. You know, there's so many 
things about the labor market now that are just not standard. Um, so I think I would put I would I would read the productivity numbers with a grain of salt. I mean, they're always um, they're always difficult, right, to infer a lot from the quarterly, even the quarterly changes in those numbers. So I would put that aside. I, I don't think that we can infer we're in a negative or a very low productivity um, long term economy yet. I think we've got to wait. But it is true that wage growth. Um, now, some of the wages were just under, right, probably what was sustainable going into this and coming out. So some of it's a level effect, but the growth rate of rate wages is still much higher than what would be sustainable in a 2% inflation environment. And, you know, if you think we go back to productivity growth, one and a quarter percent to one and a half percent, then you're going to need to have wage growth come down. Um, to three and a quarter to three and a half. If it does end up being that productivity growth is sustainably lower for longer, then, you know, we to be consistent, we would have to have slower wage growth. But at that point, I think we should be thinking about, or it wouldn't be a Fed policy, but we should as a country be thinking about, well, what can we do to increase productivity growth? Because we know that's very important for standards of living. So, how do you balance a question from David? Uh, he asks about basically how you balance the, the long and variable lags concern with your predilection for assuming that inflation is actually going to be persistent and acting and behaving accordingly. Like, how do you find a middle ground between those two? Yeah. So you do have to think about the middle ground at some point, but with inflation is as high as it is right now, I mean, it's very high. It's very above our goal. So in some sense, that's, that is a consideration, but not a consideration at this point. That's a consideration for the future. Right now, you have to realize that we haven't seen all the impact of what we've done so far, but regardless, right, with, you know, PC inflation at six and a quarter, we have eight and a half CPI inflation. Um, and you're right, we'll see the next read of that to see where it's gone. That's just so, so much above 2% that we really just have to be very focused on getting back to price stability at this point. Yeah. Later on, you know, that those considerations will come into play, but that's just not a consideration right now. Fair enough. Ellen Mead asks about your, your comment regarding the, the need to get real rates positive. Uh, she wonders whether the Fed has been too slow to start engaging in that discussion about, about where real rates should be. Because before we had been talking about neutral as kind of a nominal level, and that discussion about positive real rates seems to have entered the, uh, the official lexicon more recently. Uh, and she asks, why has the Fed been so slow to engage in this discussion? And do you think the tardiness has hurt the Fed's credibility? Hey, Ellen. Um, <laughs> um, I hope it hasn't affected the Fed's credibility. Um, I mean, this has been a challenging environment, right, for setting monetary policy and for communicating monetary policy. So I think we all try to do the best we can in the communications. And hopefully, um, I've been trying to be clear about where I am on that. Um, I think that there was a, there was a um, before we got to 2.5% of the nominal rate, I think some were talking about that as being neutral. Without the, the second part of that, it's neutral when inflation is at two percent. You know, so I think that was a, perhaps a miscommunication or a, a sin of omission or whatever you want to call it. But I think it's very clear now that you know we need to bring interest rates up from the current level if we expect to get inflation back back down. And I think that's been very clearly um, the message from Chair Powell um, at his press conferences and also at, in his Jackson Hole speech. Great. And Kareem Boss asked, asked an interesting question about the sectoral effects of Fed tightening. Um, so regarding tighter financial conditions, 30-year mortgage rates are now back at over 6%, he points out, and housing is cooling rapidly while the dollar is very strong. Is there a risk that by focusing on other financial conditions, such as equities and credit spreads, that the housing market and export sectors can become casualties, he calls them? Well, our aim is not to create a recession, 
And our aim is not to, to tank any particular market. It is true that monetary policy works on the real economy through um, financial conditions broadly defined. And we don't target any particular one of those. We're raising our you know, short term, our policy rate, the Fed funds rate that flows through to other interest rates and therefore has that impact of slowing the economy and aggregate demand. But you're right, you're gonna see it affecting the more interest rate sensitive sectors first and housing is one of those and housing activity has slowed. Um, but that's the mechanism through which, right, this kind of policy affects the real economy. So again, right, we set the broad policy rate financial conditions you know, have tightened since we started on this path, that impacts the demand side of the aggregate demand. You know, it's starting to moderate, but we haven't seen it on inflation. And so that's what the challenge is going forward is to make sure that we're setting our policy to get back to price stability. And it will take below trend growth. It will take employer growth slowing from its current very pretty strong level. Um, and it will take um, the unemployment rate moving up. Can you talk a little bit about housing as a sector? Uh, it's people are talking about we are already us already being in a housing recession, given that activity has effectively been slowing. The prices are still kind of you know they leveled off and they lag. I wonder if you're worried at all about a, a kind of deeper housing crash going into next year, especially if if, if mortgage rates do go higher from here. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's different than what happened during the financial crisis, right? I mean, so banks are much, you know, better capitalized than they were. So I don't expect that to happen. We have seen, as you said, um, a slowdown in activity. I think, you know, we haven't seen really um, prices come down as much as you might expect, given um, what's happening on the activity side, because the supply of housing is in many areas is still constrained. And that reflects longer term issues, right? That the supply hasn't been kept up um, with the demand for housing. So again, right now, I'm not expecting that to see a, um, a, a kind of crash in the housing market that will become a financial uh, problem in the banks because the banks are, are pretty strong right now in terms of their capitalization. But the mechanism through, again, I'll go back, the mechanism through which monetary policy works on the real side is through its effect on housing and other interest rate sec sensitive sectors at the start. And then it broadens out to, to the economy. And that's going to be the challenge, right? We're not trying to engineer a recession. We're trying to engineer a slowdown or a moderation in activity so that it gets better aligned with supply and that alleviates the price pressures. But as I said in the talk, right? That there are recession risks out there when you're doing this kind of uh, policy. Sure. We have quite a few questions coming in on QT, but I want to stick to the inflation theme before we, we jump over to that, that particular topic. So John Riding asks, uh, so he mentions that when the Fed first introduced flexible average inflation targeting, the, the five-year average of the PCE inflation rate was 1.5%, but it's now running at 3.1%. Uh, he wonders whether the fear of, infl of too low inflation was overblown and whether the change in the policy framework contributed to the current inflation problem. In that yeah, I've heard that um, narrative out there about that. I guess my view is, I mean, certainly the experience of the low inflation and the expectation that longer term interest rates would remain low. Um, and I think the jury is still out on that. I know there's a conversation going on as well. Is that still not true? Will we get back to a lower neutral rate after this episode is over or not? And I, I don't think we can make that conclusive decision yet because I think a lot of the factors that went into keeping the interest long-term interest rate low will reemerge going forward. But in any case, that did inform right the the framework uh, revisions. And in particular, I think the emphasis on inflation expectations, right? There, there is very explicit in the framework that we really need to anchor inflation expectations. I think that's still true today, right? I think that's true when inflation is running too low and even probably just as true or even more true when inflation is running as it is now well above 2%. So 
I don't think that was misplaced at all. Um, and I really don't think the framework contributed to the, where we are now on inflation. I, I just don't think that that's true. I think perhaps if you wanted to say, um, link the dots, I, not those dots, but link the dots, um, it would be, you know, we did use um, forward guidance earlier when, we, when the evaluation was that some of the supply chain issues would resolve themselves quicker than they ended up resolving themselves. And that forward guidance, I think, was probably not the best communications that we could do. And I think that's going to inform certainly the way I think about things going forward in terms of being very, um, explaining the poor, talking about the poor guidance, which I've talked about for years before the pandemic, in terms of the reaction function and not, you know, being giving the impression that you're prescient about how the economy is definitely going to evolve. I think we've got to be talking in terms of if the economy evolves like this, here's where we think policy needs to go. And then give, and we think the modal view as economy will evolve like this, but there's risk on both sides. I mean, so it's a, it's a less um, sound bitey kind of thing. You know, you need to use more words to explain it. Um, and I know that's not popular these days, um, but I do think that we probably would be better off if we did spend a little more time, um, a little bit more talking about scenarios and possibilities and really getting people to understand a reaction function better. And then as the data comes in, right, they can sort of match it up to, okay, this is what the Fed said. And then it, our obligation is to talk about, okay, the data came in, have we, you know, has it moderated our outlook or not? And then that links to like what policy path we think is appropriate. So I know that's difficult to get to, and I know it's a, a, a harder story to tell in a few words, but it seems to me it's more transparent in a lot of ways because it's really giving people the thought process and how we go about setting policy. That all reminds me of an old Charlie Evans speech about Delphic versus Odyssean guidance, but I'll try to stay away from Greek mythology on this particular webcast. Um, we have a nice question from an anonymous, but clearly uh, intelligent participant here on a call that really gets to the to kind of the essence of, of where you want to see rates. So the question is, how how restrictive does policy actually need to be in your view? In other words, how positive do real rates need to be, and what measures are you looking at to to determine whether rates are positive? Is it Fed funds versus current CPI? Is it Fed funds versus expected inflation over the next year, or over the next 10 years? What's the best marker for you? Yeah, so I think we have to look. So let's go back to the SEPs, right? The, as we talked about earlier, right? The SEP gives you what a long run nominal Fed funds rate is. Um, and if you think that that's, cons that's about, let's say it's about two and a, mine is two and a half percent. I think the last SCP was 2.4, but let's, for all intents and purposes, say two and a half. And you think inflation goal 2%, then a half a percent real rate is neutral when inflation is at 2%. So we need to get above that. Um, and I think for a little over 4% um, by early next year, given where inflation expectations are, will be probably where, where we need to get to. But, you know, there's a lot of measures of inflation expectations as your anonymous uh, questioner pointed out. And so I care about, I'm gonna be looking at sort of the short run part of the curve, right? So Fed funds versus um, in, uh, inflation expectations um, over the short run is gonna be informative for me. But I'm also going to look at other measures of inflation expectations because, again, I think we got to be very careful about um, when we see inflation expectations move up. I think we have to be very careful about that because it just the the history of this and the models and all the analysis just really tell you that you should be very cautious about that. So again, you know, the discussion we'll have next year when hopefully we get inflation, you know, back down to closer to where we want it to be, or at least have shown that it is moving down, is going to be different than we have now because I mean, inflation is so high right now. So we can't be, um, and it's going to be difficult. And I, that's why I say we have to really have fortitude here 
Because the natural inclination is when you see an unemployment rate go up, is no one likes that, right? We're not, we don't love that. We don't want to see that happen. But sometimes we understand that that is going to be one of the costs of it. And so what our goal is here is to do this and minimize the pain that we know is going to happen over time. But I keep pointing back to people who maybe not have the same experience. You know, when I go out into the district and talk to people, this inflation that we're seeing right now is already very painful. You know, it's imposing a lot of costs. You know, you think about people who have to make hard choices about where they're going to spend, right, their paycheck. And you have to think about businesses who, I've had CEOs tell me, you know, I'm spending all my time trying to attract workers and trying to manage, you know, what I'm pricing at. I haven't really been able to spend any time with sort of longer run issues of productivity and new products and innovation. So that's a longer run cost on the economy because we're in this kind of very difficult environment. So again, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the pain that we're already suffering um, because of where we are on this inflation side of things. You mentioned the regional context. Can you talk a little bit about what you're hearing and how the, the stories might have changed over the last six months, if at all? Is it still inflation complaints on the one side and labor shortage concerns on the, on the employment side? Or what are you? What are you yeah. Saying? So it's very interesting. Um, there certainly is more. Um, here's the story, the best way of saying it. my business is doing fine. I have you know orders. However, I'm concerned about the future. And that seems to be characterizing it. If you actually ask them, like, well, what are you seeing in your own business? It's the same story as we've been hearing. It's still very difficult to hire workers. And they still, most of them want to hire workers. And some of them who say, well, you know, I've taken down posting. It's not because they couldn't use the workers. It's just they're exhausted from trying to find the workers. And they decided, you know what, I'm going to just figure out what I can do with the workers I have. A couple of firms have told us, like, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanted to build a new plant, but I can't build a new plant because I know I won't be able to staff it. So that, you know, so some of the things that are go on hold now are not necessarily on hold because of their view of where the economy is going. It's because of the, on the worker side. On the inflation side, I mean, a lot of them have raised prices already. Um, and so they're trying to struggle with, you know, their costs going up and, 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 what they have to do with their prices. There may be a little pushback now as people are making these choices about what to buy in terms of the prices. But in general, I would say that's still on the top of mind is how are they gonna you know, navigate the inflation environment. I would say on the supply chain issues, they, they do, I do get reports that you know, think we figured out, we've navigated through. They haven't really eased up a lot, but we've been able to to, we've been able to figure out, you know, more resilient ways of getting, of getting products. So again, the story hasn't changed that much, except the tone has changed because they are more concerned now about the future. We have quite a few questions about, I think people really want to get an inside peek at your dashboard. They want to see what you're looking at your screen right now. Um, so could you talk about where your preferred indicators are, both on the inflation side and for inflation expectations, if you have any, any particular. Yeah. I mean, so I am a, a fan of looking at a lot of different indicators. I don't have one um, that guides me. I, I think, I, you know, it's just the way with models. I like to look at multiple models and model averaging appeals to me. So again, you know, it's the usual suspects. I mean, well, I'm at the Cleveland Fed. We have the, uh, the Center for Inflation Research. It produces um, the median, some of the median um, measures and the trim mean CPI measure. And so we look at, I look at those because I think that's a good way of sort of trying to get at the under, underlying trends in inflation. So of course they're high on my list of things to look at each time. But again, I think there's information in looking at all of them, CPI, P PCE, um, trim mean, you know, median measures. And, you know, one of the other things we've done um, is we do these, we started it during COVID, these, these basically daily surveys, consumer surveys. Um, and that's been an interesting tool because you can ask questions about expectations and, and get really good analysis of, of where consumers are um, 
and where their thinking is. And again, it's still that inflation is imposing burdens. And so I like to look at those daily surveys. Um, the market expectations of, expect, uh, of inflation expectations also inform my view as well as professional forecaster surveys. With the, with the market measures though, with volatility in the financial markets, I'm a little more cautious about those when you infer, I mean, you can compute obviously um, inflation compensation measures, but then you have to think about the inflation risk premium and the term premium and the, in some of those measures. And so, you know, you have to be a little bit, again, you need a lens through which to look at that before you take, which is why I like to look at a panoply of different measures. And the same thing with, you know, anything on the economy, right? You look at a bunch of different statistics, labor market statistics as well. I don't think you can infer anything from one statistic Although I know some people argue that the unemployment rate is the best summary statistic. But even there, right, we saw it go up two tenths, right? You had to delve under to see, okay, what was the source of that? And it turned out that there was a large increase in labor force participation, which should inform your view about what the meaning of that statistic is. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm apologizing if I can't give you one salient thing to look at, but I, I, I just don't do it that way. Fair enough. No, you make a good point. It was a, a rise, a welcome rise in the unemployment rate in the sense that it, it it showed that people are actually coming back in. So let's turn to QT a little bit. Um, people are asking, Ashkai Singhal asks, what role does QT play and is it possible to increase the pace of runoff to help drain liquidity? Well, it's a good question. I mean, we had very good discussions prior to announcing the actual plan in May about what the right you know, uh, parameters would be um, in in doing that. And, you know, I think it's pretty persuasive that, right, we, so the argument is, look, let's set a plan in place that will get our balance sheet down, because we know it's too large, even for a, a uh, ample reserves operating regime that we're using now. Um, and, but let's do it in a way that's, you know, deliberate, we can set it, we don't have to make tinker with it over time. And, I, and I'm persuaded by that because we don't really, you know, if people think we don't know the, the impact of the policy rate, there's long and variable rights of the policy rate, we have less experience with the balance sheet reduction. So again, I think it's, you know, I'm pretty much in the camp of let's set the parameters, get it going, Right, September is you know the increase up to the steady state of the of the runoff, and there then you know let it run and it will reduce accommodation, and then we'll use our policy rate, the Fed funds rate, as our active tool of policy, and I think that makes sense. I do say that one of the things I care about is the composition of the balance sheet, and of course the runoff is going to happen quicker for the Treasury side than the mortgage-backed security side. And so we're gonna actually see the composition move away from becoming primary treasury at the beginning of this, right? Eventually it'll come, come back to where we want it. So that's why I kind of favor, I, I'm, I think we should be contemplating selling MBS, part of our portfolio. We didn't rule that out in the parameters we uh, gave out on May in the plan. We didn't rule it in either. Um, and if you look at the March FOMC minutes, you'll see that I think it, the line was participants agree that we should consider sales after the balance sheet runoff is well underway. So I, I think we will have those discussions. I can't tell you when, um, but at some point, um, it, it probably makes sense to to think about doing that so that we get the composition back to primary treasuries, which was one of our our principles that we put out that we want to get to. But I, I like this idea of sort of like, let's set this in motion, allow it to go, right? Obviously we're monitoring to make sure it's not disrupting anything so far so good and using the policy tool, the Fed funds rate as the main policy tool. So Andrew Brenner asks about the, the what you expect the size of it, the effect to be regarding QT because and is it a linear one? Because there's, you know, there are estimates that it's going to be yeah. rate hikes. But is it, is there a possibility that if there's some financial tightening, that the effect is actually compounded? I mean, there are lots of estimates out there, right? Um, I'm not going to give you a new one. 
uh, <laughs> today. I mean, I think, you know, again, in the discussions about like, what should the parameters be, right? The feeling was, we know we knew that it would probably, I mean, we assumed and we estimates suggest that it was gonna be reducing accommodation, right? I think there's a lot of interesting research out there about whether QT is symmetric with QE. Um, there's various reasons to think that it may not be. Um, I guess I'm more focused on whether it'll, I'm more focused on whether it's gonna have an impact on liquidity in the markets than I am on what the exact, how much of the equivalent of, is it of a Fed funds rate. I don't think that's the real, the real thing. We know we have to get the balance sheet back down. We don't know the stopping point yet because we don't know, we'll, we'll know when we get closer because of demand for reserves, but we know it's too big now. And as that happens, right, we just have to be attuned to potential um, constraints and liquidity in the markets. And I think that's where my focus is. I'm less focused in on what's the one-to-one. -one. Again, again, because we're gonna be looking at progress to, toward our monetary policy goals, right? As guiding our Fed funds rate path. So again, I, I think whatever it turns out to be, you know, economists and researchers will figure it out ex post. But right now, I don't think we need to know that for sure. We just need to be able to look at what's happening on progress towards our goals and inflation is it moving down the way we want it to and then adjust our funds rate path appropriately to make sure that inflation moves down. Fair enough. So keeping in mind that the dollar is the purview of the Treasury and, and Fed officials tend not to comment on it, I, I was wondering if you could comment on it, but in the context of just the tightening of financial conditions and the potential risks to overseas economies from, from a strong dollar and how they might come back to, to hit us in the United States. Right. Well, I mean, you answered the question, right? It's a financial condition. It's, it's moving because of uh, many things, but differentials between U.S. interest rates and foreign interest rates, you know, differentials between real side of economies here and abroad and the economic outlook. So it's one of the financial conditions that we look at um, to evaluate, you know, whether policy is tightening and therefore will have that effect on inflation. And it does impact other economies. And, you know, that's part of the economic environment in which we have to set policy. So global developments, you know, definitely affect um, the outlook for the U.S. economy. I mean, if you think about what's happening in um, Ukraine and now China with lockdowns, you know, that, that puts upside risk um, to inflation in the U.S. and perhaps down, some downside risk because of the global economy. So again, it, it's not, as you say, right, that's just one of the things that's moving, right, when we go into an environment where we're setting, where we're tightening financial conditions. And that's how I view it. Right, it's just one of the risks of the outlook in terms of what is its impact on other countries, and then then what's the feedback of their um, developments in their country on the U.S. in terms of our inflation rates and our um, employment rates. And if I could follow up, how are you thinking about what appear to at least from from this side of the the, the world to be worsening economic headlines in in Europe and China? Do you see that more as a, as a growth risk to our own economy or is the, the gas shock that Europe is going through, say, is that just kind of add to your inflation concerns? Yeah, I mean, I would say the balance for me is on the inflation side. I mean, I think there's definitely, it poses downside risk, right? The global economy is slowing. That's a downside risk to the U.S., right? Um, but, you know, we're less exposed, you know, because export net exports are a lesser part of our uh, economy than in other places where they're very dependent on exports. I see it as more of a, a upside risk to inflation um, than a downside risk to growth at this point. And could you talk about, you know, the, the Fed's main message recently, you know, not, not least Chair Powell's Jackson Hole speech has been that we don't, we're not gonna be the Fed of the 1970s, right? And we're not gonna make those mistakes. Could you talk a little bit about how the inflation of today differs or is similar to, to what we experienced back then? Well, you know, back then, if you think about it, there was high inflation going into the 70s. And then 
there were oil price shocks and there were food shortages as well. Which, um, so that the common part of that is food and energy, right? We had low inflation going into this episode, not high inflation. That's a difference. But the key difference, I think, is there's been incredible learning um, since then about how important it is to make sure that you take decisive action, that you maintain um, inflation expectations anchored at 2%. And, and the mechanism for which you do that, right? Why do inflation expectations take, stay anchored at 2% is because of the credibility of the institution, right? I mean, the public has to believe that we're going to do what it takes to get back to price stability. And that's why their longer run inflation expectations will remain consistent with 2%. So you, you, you have to be then taking action. And I think that's the difference is that we cannot stop doing what we have to do in order to, re, to basically validate the public's expectations that inflation will remain at 2%. And so to me, that's the, the key difference is that was a real, um, that wasn't known back then. Right, we had to have that experience back then. Now it's known, and I think basically all central bankers ascribe to that view. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not challenging because you're always evaluating sort of demand versus supply conditions. But I think that's the key difference: is that the institution has credibility um, for bringing inflation down and getting back to price stability, and that's going to be a key aid in again, minimizing the pain of this episode in terms of the transition that the economy has to go through. So that's why it's very important that we maintain um, those inflation expectations and make sure they stay anchored because it actually helps us and helps the overall economy if that remains true. So we've got a couple of questions on fiscal policy. And I just wonder how much credence you give to the argument that it was the combination of of a very robust fiscal response in addition to loose monetary policy that helped generate this inflation? And then how do you extrapolate from that to where fiscal policy is today and that, how that might be contributing to the outlook? I mean, this episode, the whole thing was so unprecedented that, you know, there were a lot of things going on. A lot of things contributed to inflation, right? So, you know, you'd say like the shutdown and then the reopening of the economy contributed to inflation because the supply chain was disrupted and it took a lot longer to get that back. Um, it's still struggling uh, about, about that. But, you know, go back. I think people forget like at the beginning of the pandemic how like uncertain everything was. I mean, I remember saying like, wow, am I even going to be able to drive across state lines? I mean, there was like total un uncertainty about where things are. So I, I, I certainly feel that the fiscal policy response and the monetary policy response was appropriate, right? It was appropriate because, right, we really were trying to mitigate the worst case scenarios. And the worst case scenarios at the time were really bad scenarios. I think people forget a little bit about that because, you know, we fared through it. You know, like the, the other thing that I think was really important to, to the real um, thing to remember is how resilient the economy ended up being, right? And people and households and getting through it and all that. And that's kind of remarkable given where, how bad things could have been. So, you know, so yeah. So was there um, a lot of liquidity added in, in the economy on both fiscal and monetary? No doubt about it, right? Were there other, was that a contributing factor? I think yes. I mean, we're tightening monetary policy. We're withdrawing accommodation because we want to get man into better uh, balance with supply. Um, what, does that mean that was wrong to do? No, I don't think it was wrong to do. I think now we've got to focus in on, okay, how do we make, you know, the short run thing is how do we get back to price stability? The long run thing is how do we make our supply chains more resilient? How do we kind of increase productivity growth and all that stuff? But right now, right, it's about the game we have is, right, Inflation is way too high. It's not a good thing for the economy either in the short run or the long run. And now we have to do what we can with monetary policy to bring demand back into better balance with supply. Um, when we do that, we take just the way we take what's happening in the global economy as part of the environment in which we're setting policy, we take fiscal policy that way as well. 
right? So changes in fiscal policy do affect the outlook for the economy. And then we respond to that as appropriate with our policy in terms of, again, focus on our two goals, inflation and um, maximum employment. And that's how we'll do it going forward. So again, I, the premise of the question was almost like, wow, did, at least the way I read it was, was it wrong to do what we did back in the day? I think not. Um, but now we have to live with the repercussions and that means we've got to get back to price stability and we have to take actions to do so. I have a question from Arun Singhal and the question is, are you worried about credit risks accumulated globally? And I would broaden that out to just ask you about what financial stability concerns are foremost in your mind as you tighten policy and as you keep in mind these long and variable lags that might right. slap us around starting in Q1, but perhaps. Well, right now I'd say I'm not overly concerned of financial stability risk being driven by our monetary policy actions, right? I think the financial market's proven to be pretty resilient. I think the banking system is is pretty well capitalized. Um, you talked to bank. I talked to bankers. You know, and the default rates are still very, very low. Um, of, of the credits on the balance sheet, they're being careful about you know, what credit they're extending, etc. So that is, an, I think, I'm more concerned about longer term issues and the structural issues that were revealed early in the pandemic in the treasury market. Um, some of the, the fintech things going on in fintech where we have less insights into what's happening there because it's you know a little bit outside of the traditional regulatory structure. Um, so I think those are things that as a country we have to think very carefully about and think about the ramifications. Um, so I'm more attuned to those things at this point than I am in terms of there may be um, pending financial stability risk. I don't believe this is a, a, uh, a situation that we had um, during the great financial crisis and the great recession, but I think we have to be attuned to those. And that's why we do a lot of monitoring of what's happening in the markets and what's happening um, in individual institutions so that we have a much better sense of what's happening in the financial market. So I think though, you know, if you looked at the last um, board of governors put out their financial stability report. Um, they pointed out some of the longer run issues that, that on, on some of these issues that I, that I also think are worth thinking about. And treasury market liquidity, is that, is that one of them? That well, that's a long term. Yeah, there were long term structural issues there, which is why the Fed had to go in early in the pandemic in March and sort of buy, you know, our first purchases, right, of assets was because of financial market disruption, right? Because nobody would have, nobody wanted a financial market disruption on top of a pandemic, right? So it was really important that we go in and buy those. And then later on, right, it was a tool of monetary policy that we were easing financial conditions further because the policy rate was brought down to zero. So I think those things are always worth very important looking at um, because the, you know, the treasury market is a a globally important, hugely important market. And to see the disruption that happened early on in the pandemic was a real, um, I won't call it a wake up call, but it really did underscore, right? The structural issues in that market and, and the need to actually make some changes there. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we have a nice big picture question from Jeremy, which is that Given that a lot of economic models were developed during a time of positive demographics that helped economic growth, how do you think about the shifting demographic picture? I guess this is the Goodhart Prodhan question. Uh, you know, the potential for fewer available workers, globe, not just in the US, but globally, uh, and how, how might that affect our already volatile inflation picture? And it's a long run issue for the US, right? That our population and our demographics are are suggesting fewer people. I mean, the other thing going on in the US is that immigration rates are way low. But the population is, it's, it's interesting, it's a distributional issue. There's some countries that are growing population, right? So this is a, a, it's a challenge of how do you get the workers to where the work is or, or where the work uh, 
you know, needs to be, right? So I do think that if you look at um, demographics, I've talked about this a little bit earlier in um, when I first got to the Fed about sort of the demographics and what does it mean for longer term interest rates and productivity growth in the U.S. And we just need to do better in terms of, right, we either have to have stronger automation and therefore productivity growth, or we have to attract workers to the U.S. And we have to figure out the better way of attracting workers um, that have the skill sets we need for the jobs that are available here. So I'm less um, probably, yeah, I saw Charles talk about this quite recently. I'm less um, pessimistic as I would say he is about our ability to do that, because I do think that there is a lot of ingenuity and a lot of innovation that will occur um, that'll help us. But I do think it's worth thinking about, you know, what policies can bring workers to the U.S.? How do we retrain workers who are displaced from jobs that are no longer um, in the economy to jobs that are in the economy? We do have, you know, a, you know, a lot of firms are doing a lot more in training and working with community colleges and internship programs than, than we had before. So again, the need, right, does spur, I think, some good developments there. And I think we just should be doing more of that and making sure that people can participate in the economy, which is going to be under transition. In the context of the, the lack of labor force participation rebound that we've had, you know, exempting the last report. Do you actually think that hot is a good description of the labor market or is it just tight under current conditions given that we haven't recovered, you know, our kind of pre well, what's the, what's the uh, definition of hot versus tight? It, it sounds like a technical term you're using, Pedro. <laughs> well, I guess my sense is that hot would be like everybody's doing really well. And oh. it means that like labor is hard to come by because of okay. kind of mismatch issues and and it's not necessarily that everybody okay. being a right. computer every day and again. All right. So, okay. So I, I get it. So I guess I look at the world differently. There's never a hot labor market if that's the definition, because there's a lot of people who aren't feeling that they're part of this economy, right? So, you know, in general, labor is in short supply given the demand out there for from businesses. So if you still have two openings per unemployed person, that's a pretty good indication that the labor market is tight and that it's a hard labor market and we need to do what we can to bring labor demand back into, into now will people come back into the labor market i certainly hope so so i certainly hope that we see more people coming back in the labor market and making that choice to do so because that will help alleviate some of the strains on the economy right now but on, in the longer run, you know, I think there are still impediments for people to get into the labor force. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of community development work in the district. And what you find is if the, even if the job's there, there's a lot of lack of ability to get to the job or, you know, transportation issues or and all sorts of things like that, that you have to think about when you're um, a business, I think. You know, it's not just enough to have it posting the job. It's like, why aren't people coming in to do these jobs? Uh, you know, there's benefit clips issues that we've been doing a lot of work on as well, where, you know, I've had firms tell, you know, business leaders say, well, I post, you know, I gave, I offered this person a job and he turned me down. And I inferred that meant he didn't want to work hard. And, and then when you show them sort of this benefit clip, you know, it says, well, economically taking that job would actually hurt the person because look at what they lose if they take the job in terms of you know snap and all these other kinds of things and and then it's a realization a light bulb goes up so again i don't think we can ever say that in your with your definition that the labor market is hot because there's still a lot of people that i think could be um, put in a position to be able to take advantage of some of the opportunities if they were given a chance well said. Okay, maybe we're running out of time here, but maybe I can sneak in one last question, which has been voiced by several participants. And it's basically, it's again, it's a different way to ask the same question about the currency is whether you foresee things getting bad enough in terms of the the contrast between the dollar and its its major currency pairs that there might be the need for a new plaza accord. 
All right, that's so far outside of my my monetary policy hat um, that I think that's why I, I left it for last. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I think I won't comment on that. I mean, again, I am not predicting in my SEP submission. I'm not su submitting a recession in mine. Um, I do think the risks of recession over the next two years have gone up, obviously, because we're tightening policy and we're seeing some moderation demand right now. Again, I think growth will have to be well below trend over the next couple of years. Um, and employment will slow from its current strong level and the unemployment rate will go up from where it is now. But it, I'm not going to pencil in a recession in the U.S. economy. Okay. Thank you so much, President Nestor. And thanks, everybody, for, for turning in their, their great questions. I really appreciate the input. It makes my job easier, certainly. <laughs>